Hello, everyone. So good to be back here, I think, for my fifth briefing, they were saying. So um, looking forward to this one and, of course, to many more. Uh, as you know, there's a lot going on in the world. Secretary Kerry is currently in Cairo uh, working to see if we can make progress on getting a ceasefire uh, with Gaza. Uh, I was in Vienna for the last few weeks uh, working on the Iran negotiations on the nuclear program. Uh, lots going on there as well. Uh, obviously, you've seen uh, all of the news about Ukraine lately. Uh, I've spoken to it a, a number of times in the briefing uh, over in the State Department, but I'm sure there are questions on that as well. Uh, so with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and open it up to questions. I'm going to try and get to everyone. Uh, so go ahead. We'll start here, and I'll work down the front and then uh, move towards the back. And please say, I know most of you now, but please say your name and where you're from as well. Okay, uh, thank you, Sonia Schott. I am today with RC in Colombia. My question is on Latin America. Mm -hmm. um, there are some news that the uh, Venezuelan general, Hugo Carvajal, has been arrested yesterday in Aruba under the request of the U.S. I, w I was wondering if you have any comments on that. I hadn't seen that. I'm happy to look into it. I'm sorry, the first question I don't have an answer to, but I hadn't seen that. It sounds a little dubious to me, um, but we can check uh, afterwards and get you an answer. I have a second one. Okay, <laughs> then case. ask a second. I hope I can answer this one. <laughs> okay, uh, you know the opposition leader in Venezuela is facing a trial, and recently his wife uh, was here denouncing a lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. transparency. I was wondering if you have any comments on that too. Thank well, uh, look, we've said uh, throughout uh, the crisis in Venezuela that this is a decision for the Venezuelan people to make. There needs to be room for dissent. There needs to be room for opposition. Uh, we cannot see arrest of, of, for political reasons. Uh, we have to see a process go forward that's inclusive. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of progress there, uh, but this is certainly a, a key priority for us. It's not about the United States. Uh, as much as sometimes the uh, regime would like to point at us. Uh, it's about what the Venezuelan people want and indeed deserve. So uh, I don't have any more updates uh, for you than that, but obviously we want to see an inclusive process going forward. Yes, I'm just going to go across the front here. Shalo Araste, Voice of America, Persian TV. Uh, yesterday, a group of um, Republican lawmakers unveiled the legislation which forces, if passed, forces the administration, President Obama, to seek approval from the mm -hmm. Congress for any uh, final deal with Iran. What is the administration's strategy against mm -hmm. these uh, maneuvers? Well, a, a few points. Uh, we are aware there's new proposed legislation uh, regarding the uh, joint plan of action and any final comprehensive joint plan of action we would get to. Uh, but I'd make a few key points here. The first is that Congress has played a key role uh, throughout the years in our policy towards Iran, uh, most importantly by imposing uh, very serious and significant sanctions on Iran to put the economic pressure in place that indeed has in part led us to the diplomatic place we are today. Uh, but there are not 535 commanders in chief, there's just one. And our diplomatic negotiating team, led by the president uh, and the secretary and our team on the ground, I was just there for three weeks, uh, really needs the space to be able uh, to negotiate uh, with the Iranians and with our partners to get to a comprehensive agreement. Uh, we have been clear with Congress that our goal is to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, to ensure their program is exclusively for peaceful purposes. Uh, but indeed, we need uh, space to be able uh, to get the right combination of pieces to eventually get there. So we don't support attempts by Congress to try to uh, insert themselves into outlining what an, a final deal might look like. Indeed, there are a number of different uh, combinations that could get uh, to our goals here, and we need the space to be able to get there. Uh, so we will continue to talk to Congress, to hear from them. We, we'd like to hear their ideas, but we don't support this type of legislation. Yes, I like your tie. Thank it's very you. festive. Thank you. I, uh, I, do, no, I do. I like it. Uh, I, uh, I like it, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is my special tie, to get questions at briefings. <laughs> well, there you go. It worked, so clearly. It worked. Uh, yes. My name is Andrei Sitov. I'm with TAS, the Russian news agency. Uh, thank you for doing the briefing. Uh, we do look forward to many more. Uh, thanks for our mm -hmm. friends at the FPC for hosting it. Uh, a couple of things on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, uh, and I quote, you said about 20 seconds ago, the, uh, there needs to be room for dissent, there needs to be room for opposition, unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, 
Parliament has just taken steps, and the Ukrainian government supports those steps to uh, dissolve their Communist Party. Isn't it uh, <coughs> stifling the opposition, the criticism? Well, uh, a, a few points. I think I do believe what you're referring to is draft legislation that hasn't been approved uh, that would ban the Communist Party. The Communist Party is not banned in Ukraine today. Uh, we do believe that all peaceful voices should be heard anywhere. Uh, so obviously that's something we feel is important in Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, we will continue looking at the draft legislation as it goes through the process. But again, as of today, uh, the Communist Party is not banned uh, in Ukraine. Do you support the ban? Do you support the ban? Uh, as I no. said, uh, I, we're not taking a position on the legislation other than to mm. say that all peaceful voices uh, should be heard in Ukraine. And, and secondly, and more importantly, obviously, uh, with the uh, tragic loss of the Ma Malaysian uh, airplane, the uh, Russian defense ministry have released their own tracking data and have called on others, uh, specifically on the United States, to release yours. Uh, to release so what? Uh, the, the tracking data from, I understand it's uh, from their satellites from what they saw uh, from their satellites on that particular day. And they claim that there was a U.S. satellite directly above that <laughs> spot on that particular day. Uh, maybe a coincidence, maybe not. Uh, they, uh, uh, again, uh, have you seen their data, what you think about uh, their information? Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, uh, can we expect you to release yours? Well, we have released, uh, up to this point, our assessment about what happened, and we've released as much information as we can at this point uh, that we've been able to declassify that underlies that assessment. So we are continuing to work through releasing more, but I just make a few points, and then if you have follow-ups, we can, you wore the tie today, we can keep talking, so that's okay. Um, so first, uh, we, uh, based on a variety of information, uh, assess, believe that this was an SA-11, fired uh, from a area controlled by Russian separatists uh, inside Ukraine. Uh, we have released a photo which has the trajectory of that missile uh, based on classified information. We can't get into how we, how we know that. Uh, we have released that. We have also released additional information about why the two alternative theories put forward by the Russians uh, are not plausible. The first being that it was a Ukrainian uh, Su-25 fighter that shot down the aircraft. Uh, very briefly, uh, the uh, reasons we do not believe that this is plausible is because the uh, only missiles it carries are short-range infrared-guided missiles. Ground photography from the crash site is consistent with expected damage from a surface-to-air missile of the kind the uh, separatists have indeed used and bragged about having. Uh, does not correspond to the kind of uh, 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 what we would expect to see from an air-to-air -air missile such as the Su-25 has. So we have put forward uh, our assessment based on a variety of information uh, about why we believe uh, that it indeed was an SA-11 fired from Russian-controlled separatist area. Uh, we believe an investigation needs to go forward to determine exactly who had their finger on the trigger. We still don't know that, don't know the intentions behind why they did this. Uh, so we think an investigation should continue, but we will continue to put out more information uh, as we are able to do so. Uh, and, uh, do you want the microphone? Should we wait? I've seen some of the information put out by the Russians. Uh, again, we feel very strongly in our assessment of what happened. Yes, I'm just going to go across the front here. so, And then I will get to the rest of the room, I promise. Yeah. Uh, Song Cho Ri with SBS Seoul Broadcasting System from Seoul, Korea. I have two questions on okay. Russia. First is, uh, that this morning, Russian government expre expressed concern over United States plan to introduce missile defense system in Korea, uh, U.S. Uh, camps. Uh, it was the third, it was called the third, the terminal high altitude area defense system. And what is your rea reaction to the, the Russia's uh, uh, statement? Well, I didn't see that specific statement, but in terms of missile defense, we have very clearly said we are committed to missile defense, but also to missile defense cooperation with Russia. Uh, which would enhance the security of both NATO and of Russia. Uh, I understand there are strong opinions here in Russia about missile defense, but we have been very clear uh, that it is not you know, aimed at them, that we are uh, looking at a variety of other threats, and that we will continue talking to them and being transparent with them about why we're doing what we're doing. I haven't seen this. 
I, well, we are looking at a variety of threats. When we talk about NATO and, and that, we're often looking at Iran. When we talk about other places, we do look at a threat from North Korea. Uh, but, you know, a variety of threats we're looking at, but they are not uh, uh, designed to deter anything from Russia. Indeed, we've said we will cooperate with Russia on missile defense. Uh, my second question is, mm -hmm. uh, you, you are dealing with really a, a lot of uh, global issues at the same time, which really you're juggling. And, but... Uh, not a few uh, critics are uh, criticizing the Obama ad administration's uh, foreign policy, uh, uh, questioning um, uh, uh, President Obama is adequately dealing with all the issues at the same time. Effectively, even uh, uh, General Jim Jones, uh, a former national security advisor to President Obama, uh, appeared on uh, TV this uh, morning, and he, w he was uh, signing a seismic shift uh, and the relations mm -hmm. between the United States and Russia. What is your uh, reaction to Well, there's the, a, a couple yeah. questions there, and let me try to address all of them. I think in terms of our relationship with Russia, over the time we've been in office in this administration, uh, we have always said we will work together when we can. If you look at, I mean, again, going back to Vienna, where I was for the Iran talks, we and the Russians are in lockstep on the exact same side about how we deal with the Iranian nuclear threat. We work very closely together on that issue. Uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that much of what I've talked about this week at the briefings and that we deal with right now in the administration is very serious concerns about Russian activity in Ukraine. Uh, and I've been very, I think we've, we've all been very outspoken about that and our serious concerns there. So it's complicated. Uh, we work together when we can and we very strongly disagree when we do. And uh, all of those things happen at the same time because the world is a big place and we have uh, places where we do have overlapping interests, like when it comes to Iran's nuclear program. But very many places where we have very divergent interests as well, as you've seen with Ukraine. Uh, but on the broader question of, of foreign policy, uh, you're right, the world is uh, a complicated, uh, dangerous place at times. We are dealing with very serious crises, whether you look at Gaza, whether you look at Ukraine, whether you look at the host of other issues we're dealing with right now. Uh, and what we've always said uh, is that we will do a few things, right? We will, we've, we have, uh, since the beginning of this administration, rebuilt partnerships and alliances. If you look all over the world, because in these crises, you need friends and you need partners and you need allies. And so while you can never uh, make the world a perfect place, you can help address these when you have people on your side helping you. So that's one thing we've done uh, in terms of these challenges. And I think you've seen Secretary Kerry uh, not hesitate to get on a plane and try and make progress here. We have been very actively engaged in diplomacy and diplomatic efforts on all of these crises. Uh, we believe that diplomacy in, in many of these instances is the best way to handle it. That's why you see him flying all over the world to try and make progress here, because we are deeply and personally uh, present and engaged uh, in trying to deal with these crises. But they're difficult, uh, and the world is complicated, and there are no easy answers. And people who tell you there are uh, are either just not paying attention or aren't telling you the truth, one of the two. So I think we will keep working on all of them. We take each one individually. There's a different way we deal with all of them, but we have a really great team who uh, is working very hard to do so. Yeah, we can go back. Yes, yes. But you need a microphone, Andre. Your biggest success story in terms of winning new friends. Thank you. Well, look, when we took office, I think you can look at when we took office in 2009, which feels like an eternity ago, probably to all of us, um, a lot of our relationships had waned in Asia, in Europe, uh, all around the world. Uh, they had been uh, eight years of neglect and in some, some cases outright uh, uh, disagreement. So we have worked very, very hard uh, over the past, I think now six years, is that how long it's been, to rebuild these alliances. If you look, again, at the P5 plus 1 and Europe and how we're working on Iran together, we built an international coalition on Iran, not just at the negotiating table through the P5 plus 1, but with all of the countries that buy oil from Iran, with all of the countries who put sanctions in place, whether it's Japan, South Korea, the UAE, India, China, all of the countries we've brought together to put pressure on Iran, that was done with really painstaking diplomatic work, with people going all over the world and saying, this is why you should join us, even though it's really tough for many of these countries economically. So I think that's just one way we've done it. But again, look, it's, these are tough challenges uh, that we face. I'm actually going to go to New York for a question, if they can hear me. Uh, thank you, Marie. Uh, with regard to the uh, recent development in the Gaza Strip and the uh, bombardment of the uh, UNRWA school in Beit Hanun, and the increasing number of uh, innocent civilian casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the uh, Secretary Kerry 
have to say about the recent development and would that be categorized as a war crime from the uh, U.S. Department of State perspective and precedence? Uh, and with regard to Iraq, and excuse me, I'm going to bundle my questions let me do Let me do Gaza first. You stay there and I'll come back to you for Iraq, okay? So I don't forget. So just stay there. Um, on, on the UNRWA school, we are... Uh, deeply saddened, very concerned about the tragic incident at the UN facility today. We're still trying to determine the facts, but I think uh, the reason the secretary is on the ground in Cairo, has been shuttling back and forth, trying to get a ceasefire here, is because uh, this everything that we see happening needs to stop. We are increasingly concerned about civilian casualties on the Palestinian side. Uh, we've seen you know, uh, many, many rockets being fired from Hamas into Israel. So the secretary is very committed to seeing if he can get a ceasefire here. Obviously, uh, it's very complicated, and, and it takes uh, a lot of work on all sides to get that done. So uh, we will continue working on it. We are very concerned by the rising civilian casualties. We think the Israelis need to do more uh, to prevent them, and we'll keep talking to them about it. Now your second question. Uh, can I have a follow-up on Gaza before we move to, to <laughs> sure, Iraq? Sure, you can. Yes. Uh, uh, for Gaza, there, there is an apparent war crime committed uh, today. How does the United States justify this to its people, to the international community, within the principles and uh, manners that the United States uh, try to be a, a, a mediator in this uh, conflict? Well, we're still trying to get all the facts about what happened today. So I don't want to jump to conclusions or put labels before we know all of the facts. Uh, what we do know is that Hamas has repeatedly kept rockets in civilian areas, in schools, in hospitals. Um, but at the same time, we have told the Israelis and we have said publicly that they need to take more steps to protect civilian casualties, that they're not doing enough. So we'll get all the facts about this before we make an, a, a determination there. But again, this just underscores why we believe a ceasefire is so critical to, to try to get in place. Uh, there are gaps between the two sides that remain. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to, but we're certainly working towards it for exactly this reason. Moving uh, along to Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant uh, uh, is uh, persecuting uh, Christians, mm -hmm. Shiites, Yazdis, uh, people from the Shabak, uh, just for uh, their uh, religious uh, faith uh, and affiliation. To add to the crisis, uh, there is uh, some reports speaking about uh, that uh, the ISIL government, uh, or whatever they can call it, mm -hmm. is uh, now requiring all females to go uh, through uh, uh, female genital uh, mutilation uh, surgeries. Mm -hmm. uh, would there be, uh, within the UN Charter, would the United States consider uh, uh, pushing into the Security Council, uh, applying Chapter 7, for military action against the ISIL uh, militias uh, at this point? Well, just, just a few points in what you asked. We are aware there are conflicting reports, some conflicting reports, uh, excuse me, about ISIL issuing a decree ordering female uh, gender mutilation, excuse me. Uh, we're aware there are some conflicting reports here. We are gathering more information. We can't confirm the details at this point. But that goes without saying that we clearly uh, condemn strongly this abhorrent uh, practice, no matter where it is. Um, we know it can lead to very serious health consequences. Uh, we know it's affected approximately 130 million women and girls worldwide, uh, which is an extraordinary number and which is really unacceptable. So uh, we'll get more details on this. But more broadly speaking, we have seen ISIL or ISIS, whatever name we want to use, um, go to extraordinary lengths to kill uh, civilians to attack them, uh, oftentimes just for their religion, which is uh, has absolutely no place at all uh, in Syria or Iraq. Uh, that's why we've tried to help the Iraqis fight ISIL, certainly, uh, by providing support, by providing assistance. We are providing uh, advice to them and also, of course, weapons. Uh, when it comes on the Syrian side, we have increased our support to the moderate opposition. Uh, including through asking Congress for some funding so we can uh, equip and train, that, train them. 
Uh, so those efforts are all ongoing, and we're trying to help both, uh, both of those folks fight ISIL now. Uh, I don't have anything to preview in terms of UN Security Council action, but clearly we believe we acting in partnership with our uh, friends in the region can try and help them fight this threat because they have really, I mean, you see some of the Christian communities, some of the things they're doing there, it's just disgusting, and we need to help uh, put it to an end. Yes, let's go to the back here in the white jacket. Mm -hmm. Thanks for doing this briefing, Ms. Harf. Uh, my name is Maria Garcia. I'm with Notimex, the Mexican news agency. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Bishop Conference sent a letter today to uh, Secretary Kerry, and they asked uh, uh, to change the um, uh, trade and economic policies in Central America and also address the uh, issues of drugs here and the trafficking of armaments. Mm -hmm. uh, I, know, I wonder if the secretary has any knowledge of the document or and if you have any thoughts of, about that. Well, I haven't seen the letter yet. You said it was sent today? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I haven't seen it, and I'm not sure if the secretary has yet. As you know, he's traveling, and I'm sure it will get to him soon. Uh, obviously, and I was actually with the secretary during his last trip there to Mexico City, uh, there are a whole range of issues we're working uh, on in the region, including the security issues and when it comes to drugs and trafficking and those issues. We've talked a lot about the unaccompanied uh, minors and children issue that we've seen coming across the border in such huge numbers lately. So there's a whole range of issues. Trade, you mentioned, is, is one of them as well. So we'll take a look at the letter when we get it, and I'm sure we'll have some thoughts on it then. Uh, but suffice to say, I, I don't have any specific thoughts because I haven't seen it yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, let's go right here in the middle. And then I'll go to you. Let's do you first, and then, then you're next. Hi, I'm uh, Lauri Tankler with the Estonian Public Broadcasting. I got a couple of questions on uh, Ukraine okay. and Russia. Um, so in your last briefing today, uh, you already came out with the, the, the statement that uh, you have evidence that Russia is uh, uh, shelling Ukraine firing from the Russian, yeah, firing mm -hmm. alter, alter, uh, mm -hmm. from from the Russian side of the border. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, what does that? What is that going to be? What does that mean in terms of? That's clearly an escalation, and what does that mean in in the face of the threat of sectoral sanctions by mm -hmm. the U.S. or, uh, you know, what what's that? What's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a good question. You've seen us continue to impose increasingly tough sanctions throughout this conflict, including very recently, uh, and we have more ready to go uh, if we think it's appropriate to do so. So we'll talk with, we're particularly talking with our EU and European partners about how we can all impose more costs on Russia here. We know they've already had an impact. Uh, I don't have anything new to announce today in terms of what might come next. Uh, but we have more steps ready to go, and we are willing to use them if we see more escalation of this kind. Uh huh. Uh, so um, the the European Union is under more and more uh, criticism mm -hmm. uh, about not getting a decision done, and um, you know pushing it forward to Tuesday, and so on. Does the administration still believe that you know it's addressing the Russian question in lockstep with its European allies? Well, we, we do. We coordinate very closely on this, and we do think that the downing of MH17 should be a wake-up call for Europe. This happened in their backyard. There were many Europeans on this plane. Uh, this can't go unpunished. So I think that's a conversation we're having. We do at the same time know that it is uh, – Europe is much more economically intertwined with Russia than we are, for example, and we don't want them to have to take steps that would adversely impact their economy. Uh, while trying to impose costs on the Russians. So it is a balance, but we think uh, there's a way to strike it where they can impose more costs, and we're encouraging them to do so. so no I think I just encourage them to do more, and, and have said this should be a wake-up call, and we haven't seen them do more yet, so we'll keep... We saw them do a little bit coming out of the Foreign Affairs Council meeting this week. Um, no criticism, but we will keep working with them. We know it's hard, but we do think more costs need to be imposed. Yes, I'm going to go to you, and then I'm going to go to New York next. So one more here and then to New York. Thank you, Inga Turner for Polish Press Agency, uh -huh. PAP. Um, could you please tell us if, if it's a good or bad thing that uh, European Court of Justice in Strasbourg today found Poland guilty uh, of helping the US setting up the secret prison of uh, CIA where people were tortured? And generally, how, 
um, how do you find the, the fact that Poland is being held accountable for this and, and in the US nobody was actually charged? Well, I saw those reports and I think I unfortunately won't be able to comment on them in any way. Uh, we obviously have a very close relationship with Poland uh, today on a host of issues, uh, but just don't have much more for you uh, than that. So when can we expect the, um, the report, the Senate report of the interrogation? I, I would refer you to, to the Senate uh, Select Committee on that. I think they probably have the best information on timing. I don't know the timing, quite frankly. Let's go to New York for a question. Paolo Mastrolilli of the Italian newspaper La Stampa. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, you say that there are still uh, gaps to fill in the mm -hmm. negotiation for a truce in uh, Gaza. Could you please uh, elaborate on that and what are the hopes to? Uh, well, I, I wish I could, but we're having these conversations privately and diplomatically to see if we can bridge those and aren't going to detail the specifics in public. Um, but this is complicated, and there's a, a lot of issues that we need to deal with to get to a ceasefire. A lot of different partners we're working with. The secretary today has spoken with the Turkish foreign minister, the Egyptian foreign minister, the Qatari foreign minister, the Israeli prime minister, the French, the Brits, the Jordanians, a whole host of people, not all just on this topic, but to try and get everybody who has some influence with Hamas or with Israel to try and get us to a place where we can all agree on a ceasefire. Uh, obviously, we don't talk to Hamas because we consider them a terrorist organization, but there are some of our partners who do, who do. So we are trying to bridge the gaps through any means we can, but it's hard, and I don't want to downplay how difficult it is. Thanks. Let's go to you in the back. Thank you, uh, Daniel Pacheco with Caracol Television from Colombia. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, General Carvajal from uh, Venezuela, who was appointed in the consulate in Aruba, was uh, captured today. Uh, there are some reports that uh, he is sought uh, for extradition. I don't know if you maybe have something on that. I got I, That was the first question I got asked. Um, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Um, and I will say the same thing that I hadn't seen those reports and I don't know the facts here. Uh, it sounds a little dubious to me, but I, I don't know. So I will check and I will get you an answer. I promise is broader, so I'm sure you can say something. Uh, Let's hope so. <laughs> President Putin was uh, touring Latin America just uh, before mm -hmm. the Malaysian Airlines uh, accident, the tragedy. Um, he was welcomed in um, Argentina, in Brazil. Uh, he even met with President Santos, a big ally uh, of the United mm -hmm. States. Was this a uh, very successful tour? Does this, uh, what, what is your comment on this in times when you are constantly talking about isolating Russia economically and politically? Well, uh, we do talk about isolating Russia, but as I, as I also said a few minutes ago, we work with Russia. I, the Iran talks where I just was recently, we are on the same side of this issue. We are working together on the same side of the negotiating table. Uh, so we don't believe these things are mutually exclusive, uh, and we think other countries can and should have strong relationships with Russia. Uh, and we work with them on many issues. So uh, I've seen some of the reports from his trip there. I know a number of folks were in the region for the BRIC summit. Um, and look, we believe countries should have uh, relationships with other countries. Doesn't mean they shouldn't make very clear when they disagree with them, which of course uh, we do in this case. Yes, coming up to you. Uh, Michael Ignatiu from Mega TV, Greece. Marie, you and other officials of the American government, you are asking the Russians to withdraw from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. you, are doing, you are doing this every day. Uh, but at the, at the same time, you never ask uh, your friend and ally, Turkey, for example, to withdraw from Cyprus. As you know, uh, uh, Turkey has occupied Cyprus for 40 years. What is uh, the difference or differences between the two cases? Thank you. Well, I think there are uh, many differences that I'm happy to talk about. Uh, in terms of Cyprus, uh, we fully support the ongoing process under the auspices of the UN Good Offices mission. Uh, have urged both parties to seize the opportunity to make real and substantial progress toward a settlement that reunifies uh, the island as a bi-zonal and bi-communal federation. Uh, we as the United States are willing to assist in any way we find useful. Um, I, I know that there are a lot of uh, strong feelings on both sides of this issue, but that there's a process in place here uh, to get a resolution here, and we fully support that process and can help in any way uh, we can, but completely different uh, situation. Yes, I'm going to go to the gentleman in the middle back here with the blue shirt on. Yes, you. <laughs> Hi. 
Thank you. My name is Oliver Grimm for the Austrian newspaper Die Presse. I have a short follow-up and then a question of public diplomacy. I just spent a lot of time in Austria. So. <laughs> It was, uh, it was lovely. Pretty nice. I think I saw the pictures from the is, secretary. It, uh, it the is. short follow-up on the European Court of Human Rights question on, uh -huh. on Stare Kikute. Can you just explain why the administration wouldn't comment on this uh, court's finding? I do recollect that you quite regularly comment on European, um, you know, legal findings by the European Court of Justice or the... Sometimes uh, we do, so sometimes forth. we do. So if you could explain that. And then the mm -hmm. second question would be about the reform of voice uh, of America. What do you make of criticism that the, um, I think it's called the United States International Communications Reform Act that is in, in Congress now mm -hmm. would um, sort of impinge on the editorial independence and the journalistic uh, freedom mm -hmm. of, of, of reporters working for Voice of America, mm -hmm. Radio Free Europe and so forth by turning it into a, a you know, uh, public diplomacy tool as it is envisioned uh, right. and, and no, we, planned we, in this, in this legislation. We support Voice Thank of America you. remaining as it is. Um, believe it's a very important uh, journalistic outlet. Uh, there may be some of you in the room from Voice of America or from other uh, related outlets. And, and we, uh, I don't think, would support efforts to take away um, some of the independence like we've seen some people on the Hill want to do. So I, I don't think that's something we would support. We'll keep talking to Congress about it, obviously. Uh, on the first, we don't always comment on those kinds of uh, cases, particularly when they involve allegations about U.S. intelligence activities. So, uh, unfortunately, just don't have more of a comment uh, for you on that. Yes, I'm going to go behind you to this uh, woman whose hand is still up. Yes, in the black shirt. Hi, Lisa Rizzolo from ARD German TV. And I know you were asked at your earlier briefing about the European Union putting out a statement about the execution in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see if you've seen anything on that and if you have anything. I'm sorry. I, had, I literally ran over here right after the briefing and hadn't seen it. I've seen some of the press reports about it. And if we can take a look and if there's an additional comment to make, I'm happy to get it around to folks. Just running around a little bit today. Sorry. Let's go right here on the left. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Chuan Jun Wang from China's Guangdong Daily. Uh, as we know, last year in Sunnyland Summit, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed the new model of a major country's relationship with the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, during that time, uh, President Obama and later on, um, high officials from the U.S. all give a positive reaction on that uh, proposal. But recently, especially in the past uh, three months, I noticed that uh, during the meetings with the Chinese officials, the U.S. Uh, officials seldom use uh, you know, the major, major, a new model of a major power relationship with China. Even in the uh, SED, in the past SED, uh, President Obama only used the new model of a relationship. Uh, so I just wonder if uh, the U.S. has changed the position on this uh, uh, new, mo uh, new model and uh, how U.S. and China should move forward regarding that. Thank right. You. Well, no, no, we haven't. And you're right. President Obama and President Xi made clear at Sunnylands last year uh, that they are committed to building a historic bilateral relationship based on really two critical elements, and both are important. One, uh, practical cooperation on areas where we do cooperate. And then two, constructive management of differences when they arise. And I think that is... Uh, both of those have been the hallmarks of our relationship going forward. Uh, at the SNED, there were a number of uh, very productive conversations uh, that came out of those meetings. Again, cooperation where we can and constructive management of differences when we have them. Uh, those both underpin our relationship, and nothing on that has changed. Yes, let's go in the middle here, and then I'll come up front to you. Michael Hernandez, Anadolu Agency. Um, today at the State Department, I believe you said that something like three times uh, the Secretary has been in contact with Foreign Minister Davutoglu. Yes, today he's spoken to him three times. Perfect. Okay. Uh, that's among the most uh, or the most that you outlined uh, during the earlier briefing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what is behind this close consultation between the Secretary and the Foreign Minister? What's motivating it? Yeah, well, it's not. So just to be clear, he's made at the count as I have on here, you know, 15 or so phone calls today, uh, many of them related to Gaza. So it's part of his broader engagement on Gaza. He's spoken to the Qatari foreign minister twice today as well. Uh, so it's, it's, at least with the Turks and others, related to how we can push the parties to a ceasefire in Gaza. The other consultation, much of it has been on Ukraine and MH17. Yes, I will go back here. Yes. 
I'm Anwar Iqbal. I work for Pakistan Dawn newspaper. There is a Pakistani delegation here, and they met Deputy Secretary Burns and Dan Feldman and other officials of the state mm -hmm. and the White House. And there was an AP report suggesting that they are asking the United States to reconsider the withdrawal plan from Afghanistan. And they also had a discussion on the ongoing military operation in, in North Pakistan. So would you please like to comment on those? I haven't gotten a full readout from those meetings yet. I know they discussed a wide range of issues. Uh, I'm, I can check and see, um, but I haven't gotten a readout from those meetings yet. Would you have one up here? Yes. This week, Iraqi's ambassador to Washington criticized the administration for lack of support, military support mm -hmm. for, the, for his country, and uh, claimed that the, this creates vacuum, which they are going to be willing to give it to anybody to fill it. And they said Iran has offered literally to <coughs> replace the United States. Uh, so what is the position? Well, there's a few points. No other country, I think, that can do what the United States does in terms of support. Uh, we have been very supportive of the Iraqi uh, government. We have done that with assistance, with weapons, with advice, with training. Uh, there are some systems we're still trying to get delivered, which the main holdup has been uh, slowness on the Iraqi government side uh, throughout the years. Uh, but I think now they understand the severity of the situation, and we're trying to get things delivered as quickly as possible. Uh, and we stand ready to assist in a number of ways. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is not a, a problem we can fix for the Iraqis. It is a problem that needs to be fixed by them. We saw today uh, a president being named. Next step is the prime minister, so we can hopefully soon have a new government in place that can put forward a strategy to deal with uh, this terrorist threat as we go forward. And we'll help them as they do it, but we can't do it for them. So uh, I think we are looking forward to working with the new government and seeing what else we could possibly do to help. Well, we, we, we don't work uh, with Iran and Iraq. We have spoken uh, on one occasion to Iran about it on the sidelines of another meeting uh, many weeks ago now. Um, but look, we're not going to coordinate with Iran on Iraq. What we've said is any country in the region, including Iran, should use its influence over different parties in Iraq to pull them together, to promote an inclusive government, uh, and that it's the Iraqi army and security forces that need to fight this threat. It's not militias. It's not uh, anything outside of the government. And so we're encouraging all parties, including Iran, uh, to, to do so. Yes. And then I'll go. Actually, I'll go to you, and then I'll come back up to you, Andre. Yes. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Chang, a Yonam News Agency from South Korea. Uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Zhang Yesi uh, has said today that uh, the United States should lower the bar for resuming the six-party talks. And he also accused the United States of trying to achieve its target before the talks even resume. Mm -hmm. What's your response? Well, I didn't see those specific comments, but we've worked very closely with the South Koreans and other partners on uh, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We are very committed to it. We've said that the North Koreans need to take certain steps before we can get back to the table, uh, and we'll continue to have those conversations. The United States is basically ignoring this problem of North Korean nuclear program, and while the, this co communist nation is uh, strengthening its nuclear capabilities day by day, and do, do you see any urgency in the problem? We do, and we're certainly not ignoring it. We see quite a bit of urgency, and I think that's why, speaking to your previous question, we do think there should be a high bar here, that it is a very dangerous threat. We've seen increasingly provocative rhetoric coming out of North Korea, including with recent uh, missile launches that are in violation of U.N. Security Council resolutions. So it's an issue we have a whole team very focused on, uh, our, our working with our partners uh, and the rest of the six party as well to see if we can get back to the table here. Mm -hmm. uh, South Korea and China earlier this week uh, signed an agreement to establish a hotline between the defense ministry mm -hmm. of the, the two countries. Uh, I think China is the second country to have, a, uh, after the United States, to have a hotline with South Korea's defense ministry. Uh, this is yet another uh, sign of deepening relations between the two countries and what your response. Right. Well, and we, we think the concept of hotlines in general, particularly if you're talking about territorial disputes in either the South China Sea or the East China Sea, tend to be a good idea. The Japanese have talked about doing this as well. So anything that can reduce tensions and try to get these peace, these uh, uh, disputes resolved peacefully, we do think is a good thing. Uh, so those, that's just one of those steps that we tend to sort of across the board like. Yes, Andre. 
Marie, uh, when we were talking about this incident with the MH17, uh, you, you said that you are for a, a full investigation, Correct. full and fair investigation, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, getting to know whose finger was on, on that button mm -hmm. or whatever it was that mm -hmm. launched the, the, the missile. Uh, so basically, it's an open question yet for you. No, that's uh, not what I said. We uh, know a couple things. Here's what we know. Uh, based on a very wide-ranging assessment that it was, well, let me just, and then you can ask follow-up. We know uh, where the missile was fired from. We know that it was an SA-11. We know the area uh, is controlled by Russian separatists. We know that there were no Ukrainian SA-11s within the vicinity that could have been fired. Uh, we know the trajectory. We know where it hit, and we know where it came down. We know that Russia has been supplying the separatists with weapons and training them on these weapons. Now, who, which one of them actually had their finger on the button? You're right. We don't know that. We don't. But we know where the missile was fired from. We know who fired it, who controls that, ter generally speaking, and who controls that territory, who's been funding and arming and training these folks. Uh, my, my original question was about prejudging, because in, uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on one of the other questions, uh, you, you said that uh, on the question about the Europeans and their sanctions against Russia, you say, yeah, it, it cannot go unpunished. So you already know whom to punish. We know uh, which who, is prejudging. Well, no, we know who's <laughs> been supporting these separatists for months. We know that these separatists would not be in eastern Ukraine able to do this without the direct backing of President Putin and the Russian government. They wouldn't even be there without the Russian government support. They wouldn't have weaponry without the Russian government support. Forgetting about this specific incident, they wouldn't, they, they today again have been bragging about more Ukrainian fighter jets they've brought down. So we will do a full investigation to MH17, but these separatists would not be there without the support of the Russian I, 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 I don't think you are right about that. Uh, I, I, could, uh, I could tell you uh, in response that uh, without the government, Ukrainian government planes flying over Ukrainian cities mm -hmm. and bombing Ukrainian peaceful civilians, that's there would be there would be no need for the civilians to defend themselves. That's not what's and, happening. And, and, there, and there, it is what's happening, and it's everybody not. knows that's what's happening. Well, but we can uh, agree but, but, to but basically, yeah, I know. On this. I, I, but we have a preponderance I, I, I of evidence know, but, on our but, side. But here. the question, but the question that I wanted to uh, to ask about this was, uh, why is it that you are so adamant about uh, not admitting even the possibility? that uh, the missile was launched mistakenly or deliberately by the Ukrainians. They had their own motives for that. They don't, though. Let me just address that specific point. Um, uh, the uh, Russia re did release a map with alleged locations of Ukrainian SA-11 units within range of the crash. Uh, we are confident that this information is incorrect. We have information. Uh, that the nearest Ukrainian operational SA-11 unit is located well out of range from both the launch and the crash sites. So there were no Ukrainian SA-11s within the range. So again, uh, we can't make up our own facts here. We can't go on hunches. We have uh, pictures of where this was launched from. We can see the trajectory. And so what we need now, as President Putin himself has said, is a full investigation. We need to see that backed up with actions, um, and we need to see some accountability. Not, no, this is our information. We have eyes on this area, and we've seen some of this. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, Marie. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, Atsushi Okudara from uh, Asa Shimbun. Oh, on Japan, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the President Putin uh, originally has a plan to uh, visit Japan. <laughs> Japan. And as you know, you know, Japan is uh, preparing for peace treaty with Russia. And uh, we have a um, territory issue and a northern territory issues. So uh, I'm, on, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, the, the, uh, are you supporting these Japanese efforts uh, for resolving that? Well, we want Japan the country to have good relations with territory. its neighbors and with other countries in the region. Uh, I don't have more of a comment than that on what you asked about specifically. I think probably up to the Japanese to speak about that. Again, we believe that uh, Japan should have good relationships with its neighbors. We, Japan is one of our closest alliances in the world. Uh, we work together on a whole host of issues, one of our most, most important friends uh, that we have, and so we'll continue working together.
And uh, at the same time, the, uh, the no uh, DPRK, you know, abduction, issue, ab abduction, <coughs> abduction issues, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, prob uh, probably it's on the dry 6th and the uh, Secretary Kerry spoke to uh, pr Foreign Minister Kishida of Japan. Mm -hmm. And there's some report indicate uh, United States is concerned about the lifting sanction or uh, visiting, you know, Prime Minister Abe is also mm -hmm has also a, uh, there is a possibility to visit North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, you know, what is the position on that? Are you concerned about the visit to North Korea? Well, in terms of the abductions issue or whether the prime minister will go to North Korea, we uh, support Japanese efforts to resolve the abductions issue in a transparent manner. Uh, I am aware of press reports indicating that Prime Minister Abe is actually not currently considering a visit to Pyongyang. I know there's been some conflicting reporting out there, but I don't think he is right now. I think the Japanese government probably has the most up-to-date information on that. Let's do a few more. Yes, right here. And then I'll go up to the lady in front of you. Thank you, Mary. I'm from China, China News Service. Uh, just now you mentioned if it's necessary, United States will have more steps to um, to sanctions uh, U.S. Uh, the Russia, if uh, the uh, the tension escalated, so how do you define <laughs> it? And yesterday, reports say uh, United States official told CNN that more troops are moving to the border of the Ukraine. Is that is that one of them? Well, that's certainly uh, we would consider that escalation. Yes, look, there's not one blanket definition here. We take a look at the steps across the board that we've seen. Uh, we make assessments on a day by day basis. People are very focused on this. We have more steps ready to go if we are uh, if we decide to take them. Um, but you know, it's an ongoing process here, and there is a diplomatic path forward. We have consistently said that even as we increase pressure, uh, there's a different path that Russia can choose to take, and I think hopefully uh, they will do so. Let's do a couple more. Yes, you. <laughs> you mentioned uh, the difficulties of the European. You understand the difficulties of mm -hmm. the Europeans in proceeding with sanctions against Russia, and given Russia, given the uh, energy dependence. Mm -hmm. uh, can and the IMF just warned today actually of the rising tensions, geopolitical tensions actually having an effect on oil prices. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you from experience the oil prices in <laughs> Europe are much higher than what they are in the United States, especially in some countries like my own, mm -hmm. uh, which are also coming out of a very difficult crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, what can the U.S. do to assist uh, Europe in its effort to towards more energy security and diversification. Are you working with them on specific uh, uh, projects? We are, we're working together very closely. It's a conversation we have all the time because we know it's difficult. And we know that as more costs are imposed on Russia, it will get harder for the Europeans uh, across the board on this issue. So we work together um, to talk about uh, energy flows, how we can help, energy independence, all of these issues, alternative energy, clean energy, uh, basically how we can help relieve the pressure if we can. Uh, by working together, but it's really a long-term issue. There are things we can do now, but it really is more of a discussion about what we do over the long term. So if there are crises like this, uh, we don't have the same pressure, and we can help Europe uh, with its energy uh, situation so we don't have the same kind of considerations. But it, it is much more of a long-term issue, but we are working together at a number of levels now on that. Yes, let's go, go ahead here. Let's do just a couple more, and we'll go back here to folks who haven't had a question yet next. Hi. Uh, China has been proposing the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank. And uh, earlier this month, I read uh, news from Chinese media who quoting, which quoting the South Korean media saying that uh, US uh, high officials request uh, South Korea not to support mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. on this uh, you know, issue. I just want to get your comment on that. And also, what's the U.S. position on the China's uh, Asian Infrastructure Development Bank? Uh, I'm not actually uh, familiar with that issue, so I'm happy to check with our folks and see if we have a position and what that is, and we can uh, make sure we get it to you. Let's go to the back here for two of you who haven't had questions yet. Thank you so much. My name is Xavier Vila, Catalonia Radio in Barcelona. Are you aware of this administration planning to send anyone, any observers, to Scotland for the referendum in, in September? and the Catalan one in November, or this is something that's going to be controlled by the consulates and embassies in those uh, areas? I'm not Thank aware you. of us sending anyone. I can check, but I'm not aware of that. Sending anyone. I, but yeah, not that I'm aware of. Thank yeah. you. 
Yep, let's go right behind you, and then I'll come up to you. Yeah, this is Janazeb Ali from Airbnb News TV, Pakistan. A um, couple of days ago, the former president, Mr. Zardari, was in town and had a meeting with uh, Vice President uh, Joe Biden. So could you tell us something about that meeting? Because there are too <laughs> much speculation in Pakistan about that meeting. And secondly, uh, U.S. Uh, expressing its concerns over the Haqqani network, about their safe havens in uh, North Pakistan Agency, mm -hmm. despite knowing that, that uh, Pakistani military is... Uh, Right now, is in uh, uh, military operation is going on there. So, what type of uh, concerns you have now about the Haqqani network? Thank you. Uh, well, on the first question, I think that the vice president's office is probably better able to speak about their meeting. I don't have more details to share on that. Um, but look, we've long been very focused on the Haqqani network on their intent to ca to cause instability in Afghanistan, um, to attack and kill U.S. citizens, which we've seen. Uh, and military service members particularly. Um, and it's been one of our uh, top priorities to um, bring to bear sort of all of the elements of our power to help fight this threat, uh, to degrade its capability to carry out attacks, to prevent it from raising money, and to prevent it from moving people around. So this is, remains one of our top priorities. Uh, we know it's a challenge. We're working uh, to help, particularly uh, in Afghanistan, fight, fight this threat. Anyone else? Let's do just two more here. We'll do uh, right here and then... You can wrap us up. Uh, my name is Inoue from Kyoto, New Japan. Yeah. Thank you uh, Thank for you. doing this. Um, I have a question about the SA-11. Mm -hmm. The, the SA-11 was apparently used by the separatists in Ukraine that uh, it, they are not uh, state, uh, they are non-state actor. Correct. So do you think this incident would have any uh, implication when you're uh, considering, uh, when you're trying to latching up the uh, assistance to a uh, Syrian opposite? Because uh, they, uh, they have asked you to provide uh, like um, surface, uh, surface to air mm -hmm. missiles like MAMPATS. Mm -hmm. So do you think this incident um, have any impact well, we've on all your decision? Sorry. Thank finish you. your question. Sorry, I jumped in there a little early. Um, look, when it comes to that issue, we have said for a very long time that we have concerns about providing those types of systems uh, in Syria because of the risks. You just need to see the past few days to see that. Uh, and so our position on that hasn't changed. Any assistance that we're providing to the opposition in Syria, uh, we it's a judgment that you make. We want to make sure people are vetted properly, uh, that you feel comfortable providing them uh, with assistance, and that you calibrate that assistance so you don't uh, give them uh, the types of assistance that could end up in the hands of, of uh, some pretty bad people and that could do pretty bad things with them. So that's why our position on that has remained consistent. Um, we are concerned about the risk of this system. Last, or we'll do two more, two more in the back, and then you can wrap us up up front. Thank you. Short uh, question uh -huh. on Ukraine. Uh, do you still exclude uh, delivering any mi military lethal assistance to Ukrainians to, to, to help them restore the sovereignty themselves? Right. So we've provided a, a, a great deal of assistance monetarily and with other kinds of support as well, material support to the Ukrainians. Um, but they uh, look, there's not a, a military solution here. Right. We need to see de-escalation. Uh, quite frankly, nothing we gave the Ukrainian military could put it on par with the Russian military, which is why there's not a military solution here. Uh, the Ukrainians have a right to defend their people and their territory. We've seen them do that. Uh, we'll continue supporting them again with material and assistance and, and money. Um, and we review all the requests that come in from them because we do want to keep making decisions that will help them uh, in the best way that we think is appropriate. Last one. Yes, you have the honor of the last question. Thank you. Um, Voice of America, Persian TV. Last time when the truth was re reached in uh, Middle East conflict was during Morsi, friend of mm -hmm. Hamas. Uh, how important is the role of Egypt now, and how do you define the relationship between mm -hmm. United States and the al Sisi government? Uh, well, uh, Egypt is playing a crucial role. Obviously, the secretary is in Cairo. They have long played a role in these discussions. They have a peace treaty with Israel, for example. Um, they also have a relationship with Hamas. It's uh, different than it was under President Morsi, but they do have a relationship. Uh, but that's why we're also talking to countries like Qatar and Turkey and others who have other relationships they can use with Hamas to see if we can get to a ceasefire. Um, but our relationship with Egypt is much bigger than one administration there. It's strategic. Uh, we have strategic interests, whether it's security, particularly in the Sinai and on the Israeli border, uh, whether it is uh, economically helping Egypt uh, undertake needed economic reforms to help their people, uh, whether it's pushing them on human rights. 
and freedom of expression. Uh, when you have journalists in jail uh, that have been subjected to these horrible sentences, uh, we believe it's important to have a relationship so we can raise concerns. Uh, it's the best way to engage. So it's a very broad, long-standing relationship, and the Secretary is there right now working very closely with them. They are committed to seeing if they can help with the ceasefire here, and we think there's a, a critical role they have played and can play going forward. All right. With that.